Hi, this is Mrs. Gorley, and this is the BC Calculus Lesson 10.4 um, on polar arc length and vector definitions. So first of all, let's review what are the formulas for arc length. So when you have it just on a regular rectangular coordinate plane, the xy coordinate plane, do you remember what the formula is for arc length? Arc length, we'll just call it AL, is equal to what? Uh huh. Do you remember one it? One plus f prime squared. Right. One plus f prime squared dx, and it goes from some a to b value, and those are x values, right? The limits are x values. Okay, and then we had parametric. Parametric. What was that formula? Do you guys remember? It's very similar. Um, alpha to beta is going to be our next one, the one that we're doing today. Yeah, it was A to B. And what are the A and B this time? Are they X values? They're T values for the parameter, yeah. So they're the parameter, if you call the if the parameter happens to be T. So the limits this time are T values. There's no parenthesis. No X. There we go. Limits are T values. And what's the formula? Square root of dx d theta squared plus dy d theta and in this case, since it's t values, I'm going to put a t instead of a theta. But it, it, if, it, if the parameter was theta, yeah, it would be that. Um, plus dy dt. So whatever your parameter is, that's what goes on the bottom there. Um, in this case, a t. And then dt on the end. If your parameter was an angle, then you'd put dx d theta, dy d theta, and, and d theta. And then you'd have um, theta values there. Okay, and so our last one that we're doing today is in polar. So in the polar form, our arc length looks very, very similar. But this time we're going to go from alpha to beta, okay, and those are angles this time. Okay, so this time our limits are angles. All right, and... The square root, the and the uh, inside the limit or inside the integral here, we have r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta. Okay, so be be careful because this dr d theta, it is not dx d or dy dx. It's not that. Remember when we did. Do you remember when I told you, when do you do dy dx when you're in polar and they say, and you have to go through dy dx, what would the question look like? What would it be asking you to find? Um, the tangent line or a point. Right, the tangent line or the slope of the tangent line or the equation of the tangent line. They do something about a tangent line when you're in polar. That's when you got to go to dy dx because you don't want to write an equation of a tangent line in polar form. It's just way too hard. So you do the um, d, uh, you do it dy dx, and then we the only time you do dr d theta is like for this formula. So you're just doing a regular old derivative of r with respect to theta, um, or if you have any other question, obviously where they ask you to find dr d theta. Okay, so they're very similar, and I used to do this whole proof on how you can take the parametric one and change it into the polar one and everything. And I could do it, but I'll show you guys. Um, you can't see this on the video, but I'm showing the class here. This See that proof? It's, the, it's huge. It's really long and ugly. If anybody wants to look at it, you're more than welcome to come and see that. It's also in our old book that I have over here. Um, if you want to look up polar arc length and the proof for that, it's in there too. So, so I'm not going to do that on the video just because it's long. And Yeah, if you're interested, you can look it up. Okay, so there is the formula for it. Um, 
they've written it in two different ways here. I actually like the this way better, and this is the way that your book actually says it, is with the r squared and the dr d theta squared. Okay, so let's do example one. Find the arc length. Um, we're going from theta equals zero to two pi on this curve. What kind of curve is that? Just looking at it, do you know what it is? Cardioid. Yeah, it's a cardioid. Could we? Could you sketch it real quick? Just as a practice, you don't have to sketch it for these problems. These problems, this is not necessary at all, but this is a good practice. See if you can sketch it real quick. That's what it should look like. Do you get that? Because I just took, um, I know that because this is a two here, that, that means I've got a two out on both of these. Because when you put in uh, straight up, your angle here is pi halves and straight down is three pi halves. And the cosine of pi halves and three pi halves is zero. So when I put that in, all I'm left with is that two. So I know when I'm looking in either one of those directions, I go two away from the origin in those directions. And then when you put in pi, then this cosine becomes negative one. Cosine of pi is negative one. So that becomes two plus two. So remember, we just take these two numbers here, not considering the minus in there, just the two and the two and add them, and that's how we know how far out to go here. And because it's negative in front of the cosine, we know that most of the graph is on the left side of the y-axis, and cosine makes it symmetrical over the x-axis, okay? All right, so just a little quick review there, but we didn't really need any of that for this problem. Okay, so let's go to this problem then. Um, so we just set it up, the integral, they tell you what angles to go from, so just put them on there, zero to two pi, and throw everything in here. You have r squared, so you just put this in there first. And now do the derivative of that. What would dr d theta be? Two sine of theta. Two sine of theta, do you guys agree? Is that right? Yeah, it's just nothing hard. I mean, you just do it just like you did dy dx when you had x and y's in the equation. So we have plus 2 sine of theta squared d theta. Then these, again, like the other polar ones, these are usually just in the calculator. So grab your calculator, put it in your calculator. Give me three decimal places. Okay, what'd you get? Is it 16 even? Yes. It just stops? Okay, awesome. It says 16. Okay, no, no decimals. I don't, I don't know why he has 16.000. <laughs> but if it actually ends at 16, then you don't need three decimal places. I was assuming maybe that there were other numbers past that, that it rounds it out since he put all of them, but I guess not, so. Only if, like, if I put in the calculator and I have 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, like something like that that goes on, and I wanted to show that I rounded it to those two, then I would put that in there to show it actually wasn't that exactly. But if it went to 16 exactly, then you can just put 16. Okay. All right. So that is polar arc length. They're all similar, those arc length formulas. You just know them. Um, there are arc length problems on your homework for polar, and it's on the, this test that we're having. However, he put a note in this new text that says it's no longer on the AP exam. So when you go to study for the AP exam, you only have to know the other two, the parametric and the, the rectangular one. Okay? But for this exam, you do have to know it, so go ahead and memorize it for this one. Okay, um, vectors. So those of you in physics, what is a vector? Direction and how strong it is. Exactly. It's got direction and magnitude, right? That's why we've got that magnitude on there. So basically, it's a directed line segment. So it actually it doesn't go on forever. It's just a little segment here. So when you draw one, it's kind of weird because when they draw it, look, at they put an arrow on it there. But the arrow is just there to show you 
what direction it's going, it actually ends like right there. So it would be better, in my opinion, if they just had a dot, but they don't. They put a, an arrow there. So just remember, it actually doesn't go on forever. It has an actual length. And that length we call the magnitude, okay? So the magnitude, here's one of the notations for it, is x squared plus y squared. That's your formula for it. So if you think over here, if this is a triangle, so let's say it ended right there at that, at that uh, arrow, and we make our right triangle here. Well, we would go over x and up y to get to that point x, y, right? Well, if you want this length here of this side, wouldn't you just use Pythagorean's theorem? And you get x squared plus y squared. Square root of x squared plus y squared. Okay, so that's the, the length. We just use Pythagorean's theorem to find the, the magnitude of that. Okay, the direction. How would you find out what theta is if you know x and y? Take the sine or cosine of it. Yeah. If I, if I want to use this, I could use sine or cosine. If I don't want to use that side and I just want the x and y, which one would I use? Tangent. tangent yeah. So we're actually going to say um, the inverse tangent or the arc tangent of y over x is going to be whatever that angle is. Okay. So if you need to find the angle, you just use inverse tangent. If you need to find the length or the magnitude there of that vector, then you do Pythagorean's theorem for it. Okay. Um, the problem with the inverse tangent, though, is let's say I'm trying to find, I don't know, tangent, say, over here. It's got, you know, so your, your directed vector is this way kind of thing, going that way. And you're trying to find what's this angle here. If you do, like, let's say, I don't, I'm just making this up. Let's say this went two to the left and up three. So if I wanted to do, know what that angle is, I would do the inverse tangent of 3 over negative 2, and that would give me theta. But the theta it's given me, do you remember where inverse tangent exists? What quadrants do the, do the answers? First and fourth. Yeah, first and fourth. So it's going to give me the one down here. So you always have to know what quadrant your vector is in, because if you're in the second or the third quadrant, when you put that tangent in, uh, the inverse tangent in of that for that angle, you're going to be exactly pi off. So you have to add pi to it to get it in the right coordinate or the right uh, quadrant. Okay? So just remember that as we're going. Always know the actual direction you're heading so that you know if you're getting the right um, angle there. What is the tangent of negative 1 quadrants in again? Tangent of what? The inverse tangent. Inverse tangent. Quadrant. Of what? What quadrants is it in? Oh, it's in, so inverse tangent, if you're going to do inverse tangent of something, like y over x here, this theta, they always give you, if you put a positive y over x in there, then it'll be in the first quadrant, and if you put, if it's a negative y over x, it's in the fourth quadrant. So like I said, if you, let's say your, let's say your um, vector is over here in the third quadrant, then to get this angle there, you would put in the y over x that you get, you'd have a negative y over negative x because it's in the third quadrant, which is positive. But the calculator will give you your answer over here, so you have to add pi to it to get your answer there. Okay, so if you're in the second or the third quadrant, you just have to remember when you do the inverse tangent of those, those two, that, that coordinate there, the xy coordinate, that you're exactly pi off of the actual answer. Okay, you're, remember just by definition, they have the inverse tangent on your calculator will only give you answers from the first and fourth quadrant. And remember, the answers they give you in the fourth quadrant are negative angles. So, like, it'll give you, like, this angle, um, would, whatever this angle is, theta, that same angle down here on would be a negative of that, whatever that is. It's not going to be, like, going around the angle, like, the, the circle in the clockwise, counterclockwise direction. It's going in the, wait, is that counter? Yeah, counterclockwise. Um, it's going in the clockwise direction, so it'll give you the negative angle. Like, for instance, if this was pi 6, then this would be negative pi 6, like that kind of thing. Okay? That's why if you add pi to it, it just gets you, uh, if you're in the fourth quadrant and you add pi, you get into the second quadrant. Okay? All right, so equivalent vectors. So equivalent vectors are just like they sound. They have the same... 
um, magnitude and same direction. So these are the two really important things, magnitude and direction. And same direction. Okay, so if you have the same magnitude and same direction, then aren't they just the same vector? What makes them different? What? Where they're at. Yeah, their location is different. So the location is different. Or basically, they have different starting points. Like, for instance, I could have one, say, here. And then another one, the same magnitude, same length there, same direction. See, it's those are equivalent vectors. Now, the ones that we really like are equivalent is when we take one that's not, doesn't have a starting point at 0, 0. And if we could move it so we put the equivalent vector down here on with a starting point of 0, 0, then it becomes in component form. So that's what this is. If you can get it down here so it has a starting point of 0, 0, called the standard position. That's your starting point is zero, zero. Okay, so that's the, the component form. And when, when it's in component form, then you say the xy coordinate, you give it as, you put these little weird little I don't know, arrow looking things on this end, and that's how you say that it's in component form. Okay. All right. You good with these definitions? Do they use the same symbolism or the same, like, do they use um, this in, in physics? What do they use for magnitude? Do we? They do? Cool. All right, so we're doing the same thing that physics is. All right, so let's go to example two. So example two, we're supposed to graph um, the initial point of a vector is negative 1, 3, and its terminal point is 2, 7. We're supposed to graph it. So we just start at the initial point, negative 1, 3, and we graph the terminal point, 2, 7. And we draw it from here to here, and we put a little arrow to show the direction we went. Okay, So there's the initial one. So I'll label my points there. So, well, I'm just going to label the end point, 2, 7. So we remember which one that was. Now it says for part B, graph the vector in standard position. So how far would you have to take this initial one here to get it to the standard? What would you have to do to get it back to 0, 0? Exactly, because it was the point 1, negative 3. You've got to move it down 3 and write 1. So do the same thing to the other point. Move it down 3 and write 1. Where did it end up at? 3, 4. Mm -hmm. three, four. Okay, so there's, my, there's part B. So this is part A up here, and this is part B down there. Get these other little arrows off of there since we got arrows for vectors we don't want to mess confuse things all right um so then part c says give the component form of the vector so what should i write what do you think yeah these things and what goes in there Close. So look up here. On our definition, we said it's in standard position, so your initial is at 0, 0. What does this other, the xy then represent? The other, the other point, yeah. So this is the 3, 4. So it's just the ending point. And you put it in there. And instead of putting parentheses, you put those little, I don't know what those are called. Anybody know? What are they? Chevrons? Okay, you put little chevrons on it. Makes sense. All right. So part D says to find the magnitude of the vector. So how do we do it? Which one is easier? Do you, should you find it on the original one or the component, the, the one in standard form? 
Yeah, standard's a little easier because if you draw like your rectangle there, you can see the sides are three and four. And so it gets you directly to that, um, to that Pythagorean's theorem is just going to be the square root then. Yeah, it's a three, four, five triangle, so you don't even, I guess if they said to show work, you could just write that down, but you know what the answer is, right? And so our magnitude is equal to five. You never want to give bald answers, remember? So I would definitely, even though you know it's a three, four, five triangle, if this was a long answer part of a problem, I would definitely show that. You always want to show them something. So otherwise they're like, yeah, they guessed. <laughs> You know, so. All right, and then it says find the direction of the vector. Again, you can use the other one if you want, but it's so much easier if you're down in standard position. So I always, if I have to find any of this stuff, even if it doesn't tell me to do the component uh, form of the vector or move it into standard, I always take every vector, put it in standard, and then I do all of the things from it, find the magnitude and the direction. It's just way easier. So what should I write here for the angle? How do we do it? Our tangent of right. And give me three decimals. 0.927, awesome. Okay, and that was in the first quadrant, so we are we're, we're good with that, right, in the first quadrant. All right. Let's move to example three. Find the direction of this vector. Is this vector, how do you know that that is in standard form? Yeah, it's got the right form. It's got the little chevrons on it. So you know that its starting point was zero, zero. So if we draw this it would be left three, up five. It would be right there. There's our vector, right there, to the point three, negative three, five. Okay. All right, so we have to find this direction. So what do I do? Being like tangent is negative three over five plus five. Right, exactly. Negative three is the, is it, the negative three over five or over, five or over yeah, five over negative three. So it's the y over the x, because here would be their five and here would be your negative three. So, and then why did you add pi? Because it was in the second quadrant. Right, exactly, because when you put that in your calculator, it's gonna give you this angle. We want this one, so we gotta add pi to it to get over into that third quadrant. So what did you get? You're missing the inverse on tangent. Oh, thank you inverse. Thanks for catching that. So what do we get? Three decimals. Very good. And it should make sense to you because if you think about there are um, two pi radians in a circle. So when you get up here, here's pi halves. Well, if you take pi and you cut it in half, that's about 1.57 up here. So two radians should be in the second quadrant you know you got pi over here 3.144 so yeah be in the second quadrant you should get some value between those two numbers and we did so we've got it good okay so there's the remember that's radians that we're dealing with you don't have to write radians but it is radians. okay example four if the magnitude of a vector is six and its direction is 2 pi thirds, write the vector in component form. So this takes a little bit more work. Let's, let's draw it. Whenever in doubt, draw. It helps. So where is 2 pi thirds? What quadrant? Second quadrant, right? It's right there. It's the same thing as going, what, 120 degrees from the initial side over here? Okay, so here's our angle, and we know our, our length there is six. So if I drew a triangle like that, remember I'm trying to find the angle, or I'm trying to find the actual, like what are the points up there? That's what I'm trying to find is this x, y. 
So basically, I went left, I go whatever x is left, and then up y, right? So how would we find what x and y are? You can use um, sine and cosine, including the angle that you have. Exactly, because if you know um, that the sine of this angle here, the 2 pi thirds, is going to be what over what? Yeah, it's y over 6 because it's, is it y over 6? Yeah, opposite over hypotenuse. So if you solve that for y, you get y is equal to 6 times sine of 2 pi thirds. How would you get x then? You could do the same thing with cosine, or you could um, use Pythagorean theorem because you have... Exactly. Yeah, so you could use either one. I would probably just um, use the do the cosine because the cosine of 2 pi thirds is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, which is x over um, 6, and then solving for x, 6 cosine of 2 pi thirds. I usually just do that instead of Pythagorean's theorem because you are dealing with exact values again. If you did Pythagorean's theorem, you would have a rounded value probably for y, unless you could get it, you know, unless you figure out exactly what it is. Um, and, and so sometimes you can be off on that if you were dealing with um, decimals. However, in this case, we could get the actual value. What is the sine of 2 pi thirds? What is it? Root 3 over 2. So 6 times square root of 3 over 2, which gives me... 3 square root of 3. So there's the y coordinate. What's the cosine of 2 pi thirds? 1 half. So this is 3. So the point then is the point 3, 3 square root of 3. It says write it in its component form, so we got to make sure we get the little, oops, I need a negative, don't I? Isn't the cosine of that negative 1 half? Makes sense. If I'm going, if I'm in the second quadrant, shouldn't my x coordinate be negative? Yeah, and that, so the, the cosine of 2 pi thirds was negative 1 half, so that's negative there. So use common sense when you're doing it, too. So I have a question. Uh-huh. If you're going to leave it um, 6 cosine of 2 pi over 3, would you want to put negative 6 cosine 2 pi over 3? No, it's the cosine of 2 pi over thirds that is negative. Okay. Yeah. Think of your unit circle. Yeah. Yeah, that point on the unit circle is uh, negative 1 half for the x-coordinate. Okay, yeah, magnitudes, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because magnitudes are always, always a positive number. Okay, so it's kind of like when we're dealing this, I think that's why they put it right after polars because when we're graphing a polar point, we go to an angle and we do a positive magnitude. Um, the weird thing about polar, though, is you can actually have a negative r and you go the opposite direction of what you're facing, right, when you're, when you're plotting a point. Whereas if you're talking about a vector, you always, always have a positive magnitude. Okay. Always positive. I was actually going to bring that up at the beginning, and I forgot. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Okay, so there's our answer in component form with our little chevrons on it there. Okay, and sometimes they call it V for vector, so the vector is now that guy. All right. Let's see. Oh, look at that only one more lesson for the year that was the fastest lesson ever mainly because I took out the proof <laughs> there, which nobody ever really wants to see the proof but if you want to it's up here all right let me know if you have any questions